and members of the public, I'm calling Minnesota Senate Jobs and Economic Growth and Finance, excuse me, Growth, Finance and Policy Committee to order. Today is Wednesday, March 29th, 2023. Thank you all for being here. Uh, let me tell you what today looks like from our vantage point. From our vantage point, we are, I'm going to present Senate File 3035. There will be a delete all amendment uh, that I'm hoping for the committee to adopt. Uh, then what we'll do once that is adopted, um, I will have Ms. Nomer, Noner go through the, uh, I always get it wrong, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get it right. Uh, she will go through the uh, spreadsheet uh, and then um, Senate Council, Ms. Carlin Doyle Fontaine will go through, um, uh, walk through the bill. Um, and then we will have some uh, testifiers um, what I tried to do, but I'm not limited to this, but what I tried to do is make sure that we had individuals who wanted to say something today, uh, specifically a couple that um, we know that are in the bill, but, but we did not hear their entire presentation, and we want to give them a couple minutes by which to do that. And the same rules will apply for those testifiers that we will not allow them to testify for any more than two minutes, just so that you're really clear about that. Um, the other thing I think is important for us to know is that um, the, the committee will not uh, do any amendments today. We have reserved Friday for the committee to do that, and we will not take any testimony on Friday unless there's some questions of deed or like an agency. So that's the plan. If you want to um, uh, send us a word as to what your thoughts or feelings are about the bill, we are certainly hope that we have some space for folks to do that. You do not just have to say something if you're in support of the bill. We think it's important for if there's a problem that or, or something you want us to consider that you have a have a brief moment in order to do that. Um, again, my hope is that uh, once this bill leaves us, that everyone will feel good about it and we'll have a solid Senate position for when we um, go to the floor and then also have to deal with the House. Um, any questions about the process, uh, members, before we go forward? Seeing none, uh, I am going to go to the, ta to the testifier's table and we will get started. Uh, Senator Muhammad, who is the vice chair, is going to chair. And I'm certain that she's looking forward to the time to tell me to always go through the chair. <laughs> so, Senator Muhammad. Madam Chair. Senator Champion. Thank you so much. Uh, so before us is my understanding of Senate File 3035. Just to make sure that we have the bill in the, um, in the shape that I would like it, can we move the A2 amendment? Uh, Member Senator Champion moves the A1 amendment. A2. A2 amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those that oppose say nay. The amendment is adopted. Thank you. And Madam Chair, if I could have a, 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 um, a moment to just briefly put in context uh, the jobs omnibus finance bill that is before you. I will say that we put a lot of time into this bill. We've heard from a cross section of Minnesotans and we try to be as responsive to our guiding principles, which is to be transformative. Uh, from my vantage point, transformation happens when we make the necessary investments and really think intentionally about uh, every region of Minnesota. Women, people of color, veterans, just, uh, and, and those who are with us that has a disability because they all are valued and we wanted to make certain that we did that. So fundamentally, uh, I want you to know that this bill is about equity. While, this is, while there isn't a specific equity article in the past, I've done that since 2016, this bill gives us a chance to make a significant investment into communities, businesses, and organizations of color that could result in transformational change for their communities and the people they serve. This is also an exciting bill for the state of Minnesota and what uh, it means for our future. 
you will see that we've allocated some some money, roughly two hundred fifty million dollars, as a match to hopefully secure federal funding f uh, from the Chips Act, which could yield well over a billion of federal and private investments if we are selected. Minnesota used to lead the nation on semiconductors uh, innovation, but we have let that lapse over many decades. Now, because of uh, semiconductors are so essential to just maintaining everyday life, they're in cars, light switches, uh, phones, they're everywhere. We know that we need to manufacture them here at home, not abroad. You also heard from um, uh, around BioMade, and we'll talk a little more about that. But, but let me also say this. During the pandemic, when, when Taiwan and China's pr production was hampered by COVID, this, resulted, uh, this caused a massive supply chain issue and was incredibly disruptive. We can avoid these issues in the future if we produce them here. And we want Minnesota to be a leader in this field again. And you will notice that when they did the presentation, there was a specific allocation of roughly $39 billion for workforce that said you had to also get into communities of color uh, and, and be very intentional. And to me, that's exciting because we want to move people from poverty to the middle class so that they can live, live productive, solid, and wonderful lives. In that same vein, we allocated um, in our bill $100 million for a federal match for bio-industry manufacturing, or BioMade which, which uh, would make Minnesota the home of one of the first bio-industrial in, in manufacturing campuses in the nation. What, what really stu uh, uh, stuck with me when I heard about this uh, was, for example, we, we could make rubber out of a particular strand of a dandelion. To me, that was exciting. I, yes, I, I would also say not only was it exciting, it's crazy to just think about what they can do right now in this day and age. But we have an opportunity, thanks in, part, uh, thanks in large part to Congresswoman McCullum to make Minnesota a national leader in this field as well. And we are excited about the potential return on investment that this could yield. In fact, I'm not just saying that Congresswoman McCullum sat in this very seat and talked about the, the great work that she was doing in uh, Congress on our behalf. And now we have an opportunity to make the investment to step up so we benefit from it as Minnesotans. This bill also supports all of Minnesota from Oatana and Rochester to the Grand Portage Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, all the way to the corner of the state to the Northwest Angle, where businesses were hurt by the, Can the Canadian border closers. Closures. We invest millions of dollars in the Minnesota Initiative Foundation, which provides revolving loan programs to each of their six regions across the state, not to mention an investment of $15 million in our child care workforce. We had a day of child care where we heard a, a cross-section of ideas. This will not only help provide more child care options across greater Minnesota, it would also facilitate more people entering the workforce now that they don't have to stay home with their children. One of the things I'm proud of, though, is the Promise Act. It is Article 3, and it provides significant investment into North Minneapolis and the businesses that were largely left behind in the wake of the pandemic and the civil unrest after George Floyd. Um, we are, are, are targeting $60 million in grants to North Minneapolis, South Minneapolis, St. Paul that didn't get relief because they didn't have the financial resources to complete it. But we are also sending money to Greater Minnesota through the Initiative Foundation. We have capped that maximum revenue at $350,000 uh, $350, to try to get at small businesses that can't afford a lobbyist or someone to advocate for them at the Capitol, to really try to get help to people who didn't get it during the initial rounds of the Main Street grants. We also invest $40 million in a loan program which benefits the same areas, North Minneapolis, South Minneapolis, St. Paul, Greater Minnesota, which is currently capped at businesses with a revenue of no more than a million dollars or less. We have worked with a number of organizations, and that number isn't set in stone, but we are trying to be as intentional as possible by allocating money to smaller businesses that can't necessarily walk into the bank and get a loan. We are hoping this will address a need in the metro area and across Minnesota for a dire lack of capital. 
There are a number of other projects. I could go on and on. I'm proud, as you will know. I'm fr- proud to have included in this bill 21 Days of Peace and a Mother's Love and Black Women's uh, Wealth Alliance, Pillsbury United Companies, uh, different organizations that, that work with our disability communities who uh, need the investment that we are providing here. The Fathers Project, the Vivo Survivor, Survivor Employment Readiness Project that helps victims of domestic violence and sexual assault stabilize their lives. Hopefully, that will work extremely well. And I, I wanted to make sure I had a chance to look at Senator Putnam, but that chair is empty right now. But I know that he can hear me, and he knows of the wonderful investment that we've made in this area, and specifically St. Cloud. And, and in the event that it's very successful, and we believe that it will, we hope that they'll come back, and St. Saint Cloud could come back and say it works so well that this will benefit the rest of our wonderful state. And also, uh, uh, we, uh, we also put some money in for, uh, to help first responders dealing with PTSD, cards to careers, help for the hospitality uh, workforce, and much more. And see, when I mentioned Senator Putnam and he wasn't here, he came in right on time. <laughs> I paid him to do that, by the way. I want you to know that I, I paid him to do that because that was right on time. The bottom line is we invest in BIPOC communities, youth, Minnesotans with disabilities, people in rural and urban areas alike. We tried to be very intentional about making this bill, uh, uh, making this a bill that helps Minnesotans across the board. And while we will still need to do work in conference committee, we are very proud of what we put together and hopefully we'll be able to earn your support. So thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, And with that, I would ask that um, our wonderful fiscal analyst, Ms. Nomer, uh, had, has an opportunity to walk through the spreadsheet. I know I always work hard in my mind of making sure I get her name right, and I always get it wrong. Thank you, Senator Champion. Miss um, Noller, <laughs> he got me confused now. If you can go through the spreadsheet, that'd be wonderful. Madam Chair and members, you did great, Senator Champion. Uh, I'll be walking through the spreadsheet provided in your packets. Um, and just to quickly overview how to read it, The very top of the spreadsheet has a general fund summary. Um, There's a few other funds shown in in the rest of the spreadsheet, but general fund um, showing at the top just for ease of of looking at what the totals are. And this spreadsheet is comparing the February forecast, the governor's revised budget, and Senate file 3035 as amended. And to align with the targets that were released, This spreadsheet is split between economic development and workforce development, and so is the general fund summary um, on the the top of page one. So lines six through 12 show the economic development pieces of the bill, and that includes um, certain divisions with Indeed, including federal uh, economic development match, Explore Minnesota Tourism, the Public Facilities Authority, the IRRRB, and Destination Medical Center. And then the workforce development piece on line 15 uh, shows the rest of the D divisions that fall underneath workforce development. And as you can see, for economic development on line six, this bill increases over base by 750 million in fiscal year 24-25 and 15 million in fiscal year 26-27. And then for workforce development, increasing over the base by 240 million in fiscal year 24 25 and 18 million in fiscal year 26 27. And for ease of um, walking through this, I'll refer to fiscal year 24 25 as the first biennium and fiscal year 26 27 as the tails. So I'll begin with economic development, which begins on line 26. And the first division indeed within this area is business and community development. So on line 37, the Greater Minnesota BDPI grant program receives an increase of one million the first biennium and one million in the tails. The Small Business Development Centers, it's a new program included in the governor's recommendations, uh, receives one million in the first biennium and one million in the tails. Launch Minnesota on line 40 has a six million increase over the existing base. And uh, the Senate file 3035 carves out three million a year for MNSBIR on line 45. Line 46 appropriates 
$35.296 million for the Expanding Opportunity Fund. On line 47, the Minnesota Forward Fund appropriates $150 million one time. Then $100 million is appropriated to Biomade one time. And $250 million is appropriated for uh, matching federal dollars for CHIPS. Then on line 51, underneath the Business Development Competitive Grant Program, the Small Business Partnership Program receives a $15 million increase in the first biennium one time. On line 52, the Community Planning Energy Transition Office receives $5 million increase over base one time. Then moving on to the second page. On line 54, the Center for Rural Policy and Development receives a, a one-time increase of 200,000 in the first biennium. Line 57, local community child care receives a $10 million one-time increase in the first biennium. The Office of Child Care and Community Partnerships receives a $1 million increase in the first biennium, and that is ongoing into the base. Under Minnesota Initiative Foundation's Child Care Development Programming on Line 60 receives a one-time $5 million increase. Line 66 for Redevelopment Program receives a $4 million increase over base one time. Moving down to Line 74, this is the Promise Act that Senator Champion was mentioning in his opening remarks. And this is a $100 million one-time appropriation which is split between Grants and loans, grants receiving 60 million and loans receiving 40 million. On line 79, 5 million is appropriated to support the Expo 2027 event. On line 80, 5 million is uh, appropriated to the Neighborhood Development Center. On line 81, 2.65 million is appropriated to the Emerging Developer Fund Program one time. On line 82, 5 million is appropriated to the Boundary Waters Area Economic Relief Program, 2.1 of which is uh, allowable for the Lake of, Lake of the North uh, appropriation, which shows up in the rider. Line 85, just wanna make sure I'm getting the right line here. Line 85, African Economic Development Solutions is receiving a one-time appropriation of 1.5 million, the first biennium. Latino Economic Development Center is receiving a one-time appropriation of $1 million in the first biennium. Community and Economic Development Associates received $627,000 the first year. Women Venture receives $3 million uh, over the course of the first biennium one time. The Initiative Foundations receives $6 million in the first year, and that is to be distributed among six different initiative foundations. Line 90, Enterprise Minnesota receives $1 million in the first biennium. P Fund Foundation receives $750,000 in the first biennium. On line 92, Quorum receives $250,000 in the first biennium one time. Line 93, Metropolitan Economic Development Association receives $5 million one time in the first year. Line 94, for a Minnesota-based automotive component manufacturer, receives $5 million in the first biennium one time. Taste of Minnesota receives $1.8 million in the first year one time. And that wraps up the Business and Community Development Division. I'll, uh, on the next page, shows Deeds Division for Minnesota Trade Office, which also falls under economic development, but there are no um, increases over base in Senate File 3035. So I'll just note on line 137, the general fund total for deed under economic development is 727.12 million over base and three million over base in the tails. So moving on to explore Minnesota tourism, on line 149, Senate file 3035 increases maintain current service levels by 4.6 million in the first banyum and about 1.5 in the tails. On line 151, the development, of office, the development of Office of Economic Promotion receives a one-time $12 million appropriation in the first year. On line 152, for tourism to build admin ca 
capacity, um, 2.25 million per year beginning in fiscal year 2026 is appropriated to add to their base. On, on line 153 for Grand Portage, uh, 250,000 is appropriated the first year. And all of those in total, Minnesota Explore Tourism is receiving a 16.88 million increase over their base in the first biennium and about 3.7 million in the tails. So moving on to page four, the Public Facilities Authority is included in this bill, but there are no increases over base. And similar, similarly for the Department of Iron Range Resources and Rehab, Rehabilitation, uh, included in this bill, but not no increases over base. On line 181, the Destination Medical Center uh, has an increase over base of three million a year, uh, which is the result of some statutory modifications recommended by the governor's revised budget. So again, the economic development total over base on line 192 is 750 million in the first biennium and 15 million in the tails. And this includes 500 million for federal matching dollars. So I'll move on to workforce development on page five. This includes the rest of the deed divisions that um, weren't already covered in economic development. So the employ Employment and Training Program Division of Deed receives a 187.9 million increase over base, the first biennium and five million in the tails. Beginning on line 218, the Return to Work Program receives 10 million in one-time funding in the first biennium. Targeted Population Workforce Program receives 48.6 million in the first biennium and Two point, about 2.4 million in the tails. Line 221, the Drive for Five Workforce Fund recommended by the governor is included in this bill at three, 30 million in the first year one time. Line 225, Youth at Work Grant Program receives an $8.96 million one time increase over base in the first biennium. Line 226, the Minnesota Youth Program receives appropriation of uh, 9 million one time. The Minnesota Technology Association, SciTech, is receiving 2 million in the first biennium one time. The Office of New Americans receiving 1.5 million in the first biennium and ongoing into the tails. Minneapolis Park and Rec Board, Teen Teamworks, is receiving a one time appropriation of 1.5 million. Avivo is receiving a total of 1.8 million in uh, the first biennium. Of that amount, two, uh, uh, 250,000 or 500,000 over the biennium is for the Survivor Employment Readiness Pilot Project. Line 232, the Getting to Work Program is receiving a $2 million one-time appropriation. 30,000 feet receiving 750,000 one time. The Boys and Girls Club of Central Minnesota is receiving 600, excuse me, 463,000 one time. And line 235, the Boys and Girls Club is receiving 2 million one time funding. Owatonna Learn to Earn program is receiving about just over 1 million in the first biennium one time. Line 237, White Bear Center for Art. Internship program is receiving 500,000 one time. The Minnesota Resilience C partnership is receiving a total of 1.89 million in the first biennium and an ongoing 892,000 in the tails. Center for Economic Inclusion is receiving a one-time appropriation of three, three million. The East Side Neighborhood Services is receiving a one-time appropriation of 1.2 million. Ujama Place is receiving a one-time appropriation of three million. On line 242, Cope Hall is receiving one million one time. Propel Nonprofits is receiving six million one time. Goodwill Easter Seals Father Project is receiving two million one time. Pro Start Hospitality is receiving $250,000 in the first year. Minnesota Diversified Industries for Career Skills is receiving one million in the first year. 
Summit Academy OIC is receiving $2.35 million in one-time funding. MICC is receiving $1 million uh, in one-time funding. Online 249, the online hospitality training program, is receiving uh, $375,000 in the first biennium and an ongoing amount of $50,000 in the tails. Line 250 for STEM competitive grants, $3 million is allocated in the first year. For the Sane Foundation, $1.5 million in the first year. For the Hmong American Partnership, $2 million in the first biennium one time. Line 253 for Clues, $2 million one time. For All Square, $600,000 one time. Moving on to page six. The Redemption Project on two, line 255 is receiving $2 million in the first biennium one time. The CAP of Hennepin County, this is 21 Days of Peace and a Mother's Love, is receiving $6 million in the first biennium one time. Mind the Gap is receiving $1.5 million. International Institute for New Americans Workforce Training is receiving $1.1 million. Line 259 for Hired is receiving 800,000. American Indian Communities OIC is receiving 1 million. The Southwest Minnesota Workforce Development Area uh, for Owatonna and Steele County is receiving 550,000 one time. Black Women's Wealth Alliance is receiving one time funding of 1 million. Bajas on the Backside receiving 500,000 one time. Line 264 for Project Restore Minnesota, the Social Kitchen, receiving 400,000 one time. Minnesota Grocers Association receiving 200,000. Twin Cities Rise for training is receiving 1.4 million. And Twin Cities Rise increase for increasing capacity is receiving 1 million. On line 268, Bridges to Healthcare is receiving one time funding of 1.5 million. Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Twin Cities is receiving one million. Youth Prize is getting an appropriation of three million. Minnesota Diversified Industries, this was showing up earlier in the spreadsheet for career skills. This is uh, also for Minnesota Diversified Industries, but um, different from the career skills appropriation. They are receiving 1.85 million one time. <laughs> Line 272 for the YWCA Minneapolis, receiving 700,000 one time. For Emerge Community Development, uh, a one-time appropriation of one million in the first biennium. Better Futures Minnesota, receiving 850,000 one time. Pillsbury United Communities, receiving one million uh, in the first biennium. Project for Pride and Living, receiving one million. Al Maun, or previously North at Work, receiving one million in the first biennium. YMCA of the North, receiving 600,000 one time. Cario, or, or Cario, uh, receiving one million one time in the first biennium. For African Immigrant Competitive Grants, one million in one time funding. Stair Step Foundation, 540,000. Line 282, building strong communities at 800,000 one time. On line 283 for uh, prevailing wage staffing, uh, this is 300,000 in the first biennium and ongoing into the tails. For MNCAPD and Roots Connect and Freyo, on line 284, receiving 500,000 one one time funding. On line 285, the task force on youth interventions receiving 500,000 the first year. And then on line 293, this shows an uh, increase in the workforce development fund for the youth build program at 2.186 million in one time increase. So I'll go to line to page seven. Uh, another division underneath workforce development is general support services. The increases here show up on line 338 for maintain current service levels, one time increase of 8 million. For workforce digital transformation or the career force systems, a one time appropriation of 10 million. For to support an audit software, 1.2 million one time. 
Then on line 344, the Workforce Development Fund is receiving uh, an increase of 880,000 the first year and 108,000 in the tails for maintaining current service levels. Then moving on to vocational rehabilitation, on line 352 for extended employment, persons with disabilities, uh, ongoing increase of five million in the first spanium and five million in the tails. For employment support for persons with mental illness, a uh, one-time increase of four million and uh, an ongoing increase of 3.89 million in the first spanium and in the tails for individual placement and supports. For Center for Independence Living Grants, a one-time increase of 12 million in the first spanium. Then jumping down to services for the blind, on line 367 for the uh, blind services expansion, four million increase in the first biennium ongoing into the tails. Employer reasonable accommodation program on line 369, a one-time appropriation of four million in the first biennium. And I'll flip to the last page, which shows um, the workforce development totals for deed. On line 383, the general fund is increased by 240 million in the first biennium and 18 million in the tails. And on line 384, the workforce development fund is increased by 2.266 million in the first biennium and 108,000 in the tails. And I'll just bring your attention back to the first page. Uh, the general fund summary is just the combination of the two economic development and workforce development totals. So I'll, I'll stop there, and if members have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, I don't know if there are any questions for that. If not, they can still reserve and, answer, and ask those questions later, even on Friday. But I would like for us to go to Senate Council so she can walk through the bill. Okay. Members, if you have questions for um, Ms. Nolman, we'll wait until... Um, Carlin goes through the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I will walk through the uh, language sections of the bill. And so I will start with Article 2, which starts on page 46 of the language. Article 2 is all from the underlying bill, which is Senate File 3035. So Section 1 begins on line 46.7. And this is Explore Minnesota um, article. So the first section clarifies that Explore Minnesota is the umbrella office to oversee the Explore Minnesota tourism and Explore Minnesota for business divisions. Section two at line 46.14 provides the purpose of the Explore Minnesota tourism division. And then section three provides the purpose of the Explore Minnesota for business division. Section four is on line 46.23. This clarifies that the director of Explore Minnesota is the executive director and makes other technical changes. Section five on line 47.1 expands the mission of Explore Minnesota. Section six provides additional organizational duties for the execu executive director of Explore Minnesota. Section seven at line 47.26 specifies that the director be advised by Explore Minnesota Tourism Council and the Explore Minnesota for Business Council. It also provides appointments, duties, and other organizational matters for these councils. Section eight on line 49.26 provides membership makeup and other organizational matters for the Explore Minnesota for Business Council. Section nine at line 50.3 this provides additional duties for the executive director of Explore Minnesota, including promotion of Minnesota travel, overall livability, workforce, and economic opportunity. And finally, in this article, we have section 10 at line 52.1. This clarifies that the director may expend money for promotional expenses related to overall livability, workforce, and economic opportunity. Moving on then to article three, which is called the Promise Act. This is a chair's initiative. Section one at line 52.14, this would provide a title for this article, as providing resources, opportunity, and maximizing investments in striving entrepreneurs, the Promise Act. Section two at line 52.17, this section creates the Promise Grant Program 
to provide grants through partner organizations of up to $50,000 per grant to businesses in the areas identified. And then it contains other specific provisions regarding um, the grant making process. Section three at line 54.13, this creates the Promise Loan Program to provide loans through partner organizations of up to $1 million per loan to businesses in the areas identified. And similarly, there will be additional detail regarding um, interest rate and uh, the amount of annual revenue for the businesses receiving loans. Then we have Article 4. This is a deed policy article. Um, I think all of this article, except for as I will specify, comes also from the underlying bill, Senate File 3035. So beginning with Section 1, this is at line 56.23. This section creates the Office of Child Care Community Partnerships with Indeed, which will serve to coordinate the various child care initiatives among agencies and other entities for Minnesota. Section 2 at line 58.7. This uh, is the Senate language. Uh, it was also carried in the underlying bill, but this would be the Senate language from Senator Muhammad's bill, Senate File 360. And it establishes the Office of New Americans with Indeed and creates an interdepartmental coordination, coordination council on immigrant and refugee affairs to advise the office. Section three, um, we're moving back just to language that came from the underlying bill. Section three at line 61.14, point, point, uh, this allows the Energy Transition Advisory Committee to meet quarterly instead of monthly, and then after the energy transition plan is submitted, they can establish a schedule to meet as needed. Section four is also regarding the Energy Transition Advisory Committee, and it provides an expiration date for the, uh, for the committee of June 30th, 2027. Section five at line 61.23 establishes a small business assistance partnerships program to provide grants to local and regional community-based organizations for business development and technical assistance services. Section six at line 62.25 establishes the Minnesota Expanding Opportunity Fund Program to capitalize Minnesota nonprofit corporations to increase lending activities with small businesses. Section seven to nine, beginning at line 64.17. Uh, these sections modify certain employee retention and spending requirements for the job creation fund program and all additionally creates a fourth tier for awards. Section 10, beginning at line 69.13, allows the commissioner to transfer funds between the job creation fund and the redevelopment program based on business demand. Sections 11 to 14, beginning at line 69.18, these, these sections make modifications to the Main Street Economic Revitalization Program with regard to leveraged grant limits, partner organization provisions, the number of grant rounds for the program, and uh, the exemptions to grant uh, making statutes expiration date. Uh, section 15 then beginning at line 72.14, this codifies the Launch Minnesota, Launch Minnesota program, which has operated as an uncodified program since 2019, and provides entrepreneurs, um, this provides um, entrepreneurs and emerging technology-based companies, uh, business development assistance and financial assistance. Section 16 is at line 78.16. This section creates the Minnesota Forward Fund. And the, the, the fund is created for the purpose of increasing state competitiveness to facilitate private investment through offering incentives to compete with other states for business retention, attract new industries, and meet matching requirements of federal funding, among other abilities of the fund. Section 17 to 19, beginning at uh, line 82.28, these modify the Youth Build program to be consistent with the, with the federal program, including our, and also includes a reference to the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. Section 20 at line 84.8 .8 establishes several grant, um, targeted grant programs with Indeed, including a, a job and entrepreneurial skills training grants program, diversity inclusion training for small employers, and, a capaci and capacity building grants. Sections 21 to 22, beginning at line 86.21, make changes to the Minnesota Youth Program by increasing the eligible applicant age range to um, 14 to 24 instead of as it is now for ages 14 to 21. 
section 23 at line 89.26. Uh, this makes a reference change within the definition of economically disadvantaged to cite the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act within the Youth at Work grant program. Sections 24 to 26, these statutory changes were, were not in the underlying bill. However, they were uh, mentioned and, and included in the governor's revised budget recommendations. This is at line 87.22, and these... Uh, uh, these, these sections modify provisions within the Destination Medical Center initiative statutes regarding state transit aid by broadening the definition of transit costs to include buses and including construction costs and similar costs in the definition of expenditures. And finally, in this article, we have section 27 at uh, line 90.22. This requires the Commissioner of uh, Employment and Economic Development to establish a reasonable accommodation reimbursement pilot grant program to re reimburse eligible employers for expenses related to providing reasonable accommodations for individ individuals with a disability who are either applicants or employees of the employer. And finally, we come to Article 5, which is titled Miscellaneous Policy. And basically, this is uh, th this, these are things that were um, decided as uh, priorities for, for the, um, the chair among conversations, and these were not included in the underlying bill. So I will just um, go through these sections and let you know which bill they, came, they are, where they came from. So section one at line 92.24, <clears throat> this is from Senate File 607, Senator Herr's bill. This codifies the Getting to Work Grant Program, that, which has been around for a while and has received uh, appropriations in the past. And this uh, grant program provides grants to nonprofit organizations to operate programs that provide repair or repair or maintain motor, motor vehicles to assist individuals to obtain or maintain employment. Section two, this is from Senator Housechild's bill. Uh, this is sections two and three <laughs> and four are from Senator Housechild's bill, Senate file 1173. The first section two at line 95.1 modifies the definition of eligible community. This is within the community Ener energy transition grant program. It would include a community that hosts an electric generating plant whose current operating license will expire within 15 years of the effective date of the section. Section three at line 95.12 eliminates the requirement that community energy transition grants be awarded through a competitive grant process also clarifies that an eligible community can receive uh, a grant award of up to $1 million per calendar year and allows grant applicants, um, grant applications to be accepted on an ongoing or, or rolling basis. Section four, again, is from Senator House Child's bill at 90, line 95.23. This allows the commissioner to transfer administrative funds to the Environmental Quality Board to assist communities with regulatory coordination and technical assistance. Section five is from Senator Champion's bill, Senate file 1084, at line, this is at line 96.14. It establishes the Emerging Developer Fund Program to make loans to emerging developers for eligible projects statewide for economic development and the creation and retention of jobs in Minnesota. I think I may, so I believe it's section six is next at line 99.11. This is from Senator uh, Green's bill, Senate file 2784. This language is as it was amended in the Jobs Committee. This modifies provisions uh, and applicable dates in the 2021 session law for the forgivable loan program for remote recreational businesses. And finally, uh, the last section, uh, line 100.27. This is from a Senator Housechild bill Senate file 1574, and this was also amended in the Jobs Committee, and so this, this is the language as it was amended. This establishes the Canadian Border Counties Economic Relief Program to assist businesses adversely affected by the 2021 closure of the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness or the closure of the Canadian border. And that uh, concludes my walkthrough, M Madam Chair and members and Senator Champion. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you. Uh, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you so much to uh, uh, both fiscal, our fiscal analyst, Ms. Noner, and as well as Ms. Uh, Doyle Fontaine for uh, going through their respective uh, lanes. So I sincerely appreciate that. 
I hope that the committee has an opportunity to see that there's a mixture of both competitive grants, direct appropriations, uh, and just so that you'll know and you'll be able to get some of this information on Friday, we will and, and, and have required that all organizations present a 990 so, this, so that we can make sure that they are able and have the capacity to do this work. Uh, and you also hear from either now or after, well, maybe we'll do it now. I don't know if Dariel, Dannon, or someone from the agencies here, I just wanted them to talk briefly about uh, the bill itself, but also um, what they can do and what they have in place in order to help us make sure that uh, we are able to do the work that we see here and make sure that folks are above board. That is always important to us, and I uh, thank the deed for also listening to a, um, uh, a presentation that we did with another outside agency organization as well, because we, we are really committed to really making sure that our resources are um, protected. So if, if Ms. Uh, Dannon is able to speak briefly, that'd be great, Madam Chair. Great. Thank you, Senator Champion. You can go ahead, Daryl, and state your name for the record. Yep. Thank you, Senator. Um, my name is Daryl Dannon, and I'm the Government Relations Director at the Department of Employment and Economic Development. And yes, as a Senator reference, we did have a, a great meeting with a group um, kind of discussing some of there are a number of outside groups that provide resources that help organizations like my agency verify identities and ensure that we're tracking um, state dollars appropriately. Um, one of the things that came out of that conversation is, is the realization that we, we as an agency do have those practices in place. And so I'll just talk a little bit briefly about some of the things we do that you may or may not know, um, and then happy to answer questions as well. Um, so under state law, we are required with all of our grantees, we have a grant agreement. So everyone who gets a direct appropriation and then anyone who might receive funding through a competitive grant, they are required by the state of Minnesota. They have a grant agreement with us that lays out who they'll serve, how many folks. That also lays out with, um, ensures that we as a state agency can track and ensure that they have appropriate outcomes. So for instance, if they received an, a pot of money to do a certain thing, if you specified it in legislation, that would be in the grant agreement. So if you specified in legislation, legislation that um, they're going to receive a million dollars to train individuals in healthcare field, uh, then their grant agreement will specify that, and those will be the outcomes that we as an agency track. We do have, and hopefully you're aware that we have, we have a case management system as well. So when we are training individuals in workforce development, so when we are training people in skills, and in fact, for my example there, if we were training individuals to be in the healthcare field, they're in a case management system. It's called Workforce One. It's required by state law. We also provide quarterly reports that are available online. I can send the committee the link so you can go in and check it out if you want to. Um, it's called the Uniform Report Card. And so that specifies all of the different participants that each organization served, their wages. It doesn't it doesn't list every individual's wage, but on a basis, on a total basis, it shows the change in wages between before they entered the program and after the program, and also shows the cost per participant. So it provides that in that information um, for anyone that's served by state dollars as well. So we try to be really transparent um, as an agency. We also do have controls in place, fiscal controls in place, to ensure that we're managing those dollars. So we provide resources typically on a reimbursement basis, which means an organization, oops, which means an organization. Um, begins to do the work that they have a contract to do, um, and then they provide us receipts, and, and we then reimburse them after the fact so that we are tracking those dollars. If an organization is new to the state, we also go out after three months and we do what's called a monitoring visit. So we go out, we check through their files, we ensure that the receipts that we received are consistent with what's called the general ledger. We do some basic accounting and monitoring. We also are required to audit and monitor um, every single organization that receives funds direct appropriation or competitive grants, which we have a whole team of staff at our agency that do. So I think there, Sunder, I will stop. And if there's anything you want to ping me on, feel free. <laughs> or of course, if members of the committee have questions, I'm happy to answer them as well. Thank you, Daryl. Senator Champion, do you have anything to add? Nothing to add, but I know that the agency will be available uh, between now and also Friday. So if you have some questions you want to ask uh, Deed privately, you can certainly do that, and that would be welcomed and appropriate, because what we've tried to do is be as transparent and thoughtful in order to make sure that we are um, uh, protecting our uh, uh, taxpayer dollars, but also making sure that we can make transfer, a transformative change across the state of Minnesota. So thank you. Thank you. So then now we'll go to your testifiers, Senator yes. Champion. And we'll so, 
Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, uh, Madam Chair, I'm sure that you're about to tell, tell me don't talk over the chair, and I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Champion. <laughs> so we'll go to Wokey Freeman, who's with you Prize, Youth Prize. Yeah, that person is mm. He is sick, so he can come, but I think we have somebody on Zoom, Marcus Polk. Hello, everyone, and clearly I am not, um, Madam Chair, I'm not Marcus Pope. He had to step out briefly, so I'm filling in. I'm Christy Snyder. Um, I work under Mar Marcus Pope. Um, I'm the director of the Twin Cities Opportunity Youth Network, and I'm going to read his statement, if that's okay with you, Madam Chair. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, my name is Marcus Pope, president of Youth Prize. I want to thank you for including Senate File 2578 in your omnibus bill. I also would like to say to thank Senator Hare for chief authoring the bill, um, and this is Wookie's testimony. Um, prior to joining Youth Prize, I served as assistant city manager for the city of Brooklyn Park for nearly seven years, and for six years before that, as assistant executive director and director of operations and programs at the University of Minnesota so this Urban Research and Outreach Engagement Center, where I saw firsthand the challenges that many young people in our African immigrant communities face regarding access to culturally competent career and workforce development opportunities. I am proud that Youth Prize has been instrumental in helping to meet that critical need within the East African immigrant community. In 2022 alone, Youth Prize subgrantees served 1,799 youth in various job placement, educational, work readiness training, career planning, and mentoring services. As you'll see on our one pager, as a West African woman, I'm excited this session to see the scope of this funding increase to include other African immigrant communities as a natural expansion base on what we are hearing as a need from the larger community. We've also seen more organizations requesting grants. We received double the amount in requests for just the East African grants, 3 million for the 1.4 million that we had. We know that there is a need and a desire for creating culturally competent bridges for youth workforce activities serving other African immigrant communities in Minnesota. Um, if you can wrap up, that would be great. Yes, we're grateful for this funding. We know of the impact it will have throughout the state. And um, we're thankful for the advocacy of um, all of the folks on this committee to make sure that this funding increased and the impact that we're able to have. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, thank you so much, Senator Champion, and everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you, Senator Champion. We'll, we, we, we had to change some stuff, so we'll be going off of my list and not yours. And next, we have one more testifier who has to testify on Zoom. So we'll go with them first. Mohamed Farah from Kijok. You please state your name for the record, and you have two minutes. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, uh, members of this committee. Thank you for including Senate File 3035 into your omnibus bill. My name is Mohamed Farah. I serve as the Executive Director of Kijok, a National Somali Youth American uh, Development Organization headquartered in Minneapolis. We are dedicated in enhancing the lives of Somali American youth by utilizing education, the elements of education, mentorship, and employment. As a statewide organization that primarily works with the East African community across the state, we focus our efforts in development of our youth and families in making them as economically sufficient as possible. Providing in an avenue of employment and setting career pathways is the center of what we do. We believe in, we have a role in creating a more diverse workforce starting with our youth. Our East African Youth at Work program creates a two-way opportunity. We help youth gain on the job experience and we also help them, employers, create workforce, play, workforce uh, um, uh, more, more workforce uh, culturally uh, aware uh, uh, sites. Uh, the East African Youth at Work program builds job skills for East African youth at work across our state and positions them for employment success through internship placement, career exploration, soft skill development, and mentorship. All participants who successfully, create, who successfully went through our program received career assessment and ex exploration services, an individualized work plan, and paid internship or job placement. Over the years, our program participants so far have sought in various careers, such as information technology, health sector, accounting, business management, business administration, public service, and many others. Providing hands-on training is an essential part in the program. With your continued support of this committee, we 
we, uh, we can continue doing some great work throughout the state. This committee and the state of Minnesota have partners like Youth Price and Kajok who have been on the ground and have been partners with the state for many years. This committee understands the racial inequality that exists in Minnesota. I cannot express enough the work that must be done uh, in, our, uh, in, in the communities uh, across our state. I would like to express, uh, Madam Chair, to you and members of this committee uh, for supporting this bill. Thank you, Mohammed. And then now we'll go to your testifiers at the table, Senator Champion. Thank you so very much, Madam Chair. I'm going to go to Makram El Amin, who's the CEO of El Amun. Uh, he uh, has been doing North at Work, and North at Work has been an organization uh, and work that's been done since 2016, and we have uh, been supportive of that program. If you look back, you will probably see first um, uh, that it was the North Side uh, uh, the funders, the funders group. group, and then uh, it was the Minneapolis Foundation that was their fiscal agent, as well as the Center for Economic Inclusion. And so now we, we are transitioning that same organization and group, but there, there's a different uh, fiscal agent. And so he, uh, uh, my testifier, who's been running this and doing this for all these years, can talk more about that in his two minutes of testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Makram. If you can state your name for the record and keep your testimony to two minutes. Yes. My name is Makram El um, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Senator Champion, we appreciate the opportunity to testify on behalf of the work of uh, what was at North at Work and now El Maun. Uh, we have been focused on uh, African-American uh, males uh, as well as African diaspora males to get them work readiness training, get them training that leads to employment as well as uh, work readiness training um, and also uh, employment coaching. And we have uh, been working, as was just stated, since 2016 on this project and been leading this effort for the last couple of years directly um, in this work. I'm happy to share that we have exceeded um, our uh, benchmarks in terms of number of men full-time employed, uh, as well as the number, which is 78. Um, and we, the work credentialed earns uh, were 22. The average wage was over $20 per hour for those who have come through our program with 118 days of uh, an average in the program as well. And just a quick note of the demographics, 76% of the demographic were previously incarcerated, and 50, over 53% were uh, unsheltered at the time of enrollment. And we served all of our participants were under the 200% uh, percent poverty level uh, in, the, in the state. So we uh, feel really good about the, the impact of our work. We are grateful for the continued support and the increased support um, uh, on behalf of um, El Maun, and just want to be grateful to this committee, and particularly Senator Champion, for his championing of our work. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll go with Alfred next. If you can state your name for the record and keep your testimony to two minutes. Certainly. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and Senator Champion, committee members. Um, the program that we're talking about is something we are calling Stepping Up. Um, and there are two kinds of uh, entertainment figures that put forward some songs that kind of help to understand, I think, the point of what we're about. One was Groucho Marx. Groucho Marx, who had a song he sang, which is, Hello, I Must Be Going. <laughs> some remember that song. And, and, and the point of it is, uh, being trapped in a place where there's no substance, where there's no real tomorrow in it, there's this moment, and this moment is a very narrow, constricted one. And then there's Ben Marin, who sang a song about trying to find my corner of the sky. Very aspirational. The, the point is, too many people in our community are trapped in that, hello, I must be going, space. Uh, a hopelessness almost as a cancer. And, and particularly on the economic scale of things, so as many of our young people think that uh, it's either the streets or McDonald's and that's it. Uh, but we think that, and we know, that there is this area called middle skills, uh, a place in which many of our community are unaware that there are skills that they already have uh, there are opportunities that are already present, but the connection is not being made. And so in this, we are seeking to do that for, for people throughout the community, and we're doing it with 
a way that's a double bottom line. We're utilizing the African American church network, which has been historically the great asset of our community. Uh, we're using it then to help to bring it forward as a relevant instrument again, such that we have that, that moral voice, that value voice, having a little more credibility in the street. So we're grateful to, for Senator Champion and for you, and we hope that you will be supportive. Thank you so much. And then we'll go to Katie Topinka. Katie, if you can state your name for the record um, and keep your testimony to two minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members and Senator Champion. My name is Katie Topinka. I'm the Director of Intergovernmental Relations for the City of Minneapolis. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to comment on the um, Jobs and Economic Development Omnibus Finance Bill. And thank you to Senator Champion for your ongoing commitment to equity and inclusive economic growth and recovery. Uh, the City of Minneapolis is committed to uh, economic recovery through increased small business and real estate ownership. The City has been supporting property owners with capital needs to rebuild um, following the um, pan effects of the pandemic and the civil unrest after the murder of George Floyd. Um, and we're also helping to navigate, helping businesses navigate the systems needed to secure permits and complete reconstruction. Um, to date, the city has awarded $12.7 million in city funds into 25 development projects, leveraging over $72 million in total investment. Uh, the funding to the organizations and entities in this bill will support this ongoing inclusive economic recovery in the city of Minneapolis, and it will support many organizations that are committed to advancing racial equity. Um, as part of our legislative agenda, the city of Minneapolis uh, has requested direct appropriations from the state for our commercial property development fund to catalyze economic recovery from both the pandemic and civil unrest of 2020. Uh, while there is not a direct appropriation included in this bill, we do very much appreciate the chair's strong commitment to economic recovery in Minneapolis and our region with the $100 million in the Promise Act. This funding will support ongoing recovery needs and long-term efforts to reverse the impacts of structural racism, uh, including access to capital for businesses and property ownership, both in Minneapolis and across the region. Uh, we look forward to ongoing conversations um, about how the city and state can work together to support Minneapolis business owners and residents in this effort. Uh, so thank you again to Senator Champion and the committee, um, and thank you for the opportunity to provide comments on the bill. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, Anthony? If you can state your name for the record and keep your testimony to two minutes. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, uh, committee members, and good to see you, Senator Champion. Good to see you. Thank you. you. Uh, my name is Anthony Taylor. I am uh, here in a couple roles. I'm a uh, uh, development leader for the Cultural Wellness Center. Um, we are a South Minneapolis-based organization that has been around for 27 years and have the extreme unique pleasure of working specifically on projects that are on 38th. Street in South Minneapolis, on Lake Street, and on Broadway in the north side. Um, the Cultural Wellness Center exists as a community defined and owned institution. Our current need for investment, relief, and recovery is anchored in, in leveraging equity, continuity, and transformational um, change in communities that have been historically underinvested and disinvested. We have um, these. Uh, investments are not investments in buildings and businesses and business sectors. These are investments in people, families, and communities. Uh, these are investments creating communities of opportunity that align in patient uh, capital investment uh, with human capital investment, uh, and this unique combination of investments in economic and development and workforce development investments that turn into family stabilizing income that ultimately lead to generational wealth creation and mobility for those that live in the communities now. Uh, these investments also interrupt the belief that our families and our entrepreneurs need to move out of these communities to realize the dreams that they have for themselves and for their children. Uh, the Promise Act sets us up for an opportunity, again, to align human capital investment, for us to look at ways that we are creating transformational investment by mobilizing investment in businesses, communities, and repairing historical harms. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anthony. Next, we'll go to Elliot Boutte. Madam Chair. Senator Champion. Uh, can we have, um, I know that you don't see this on there, but she should have been on there. Ms. Emma Corey and the other can come as well. She's from Twin Cities Rise. There's, we know that we heard one of their bills, but the other that I just wanted to speak briefly about that we have included, which is about the, I hope I'm 
uh, pronouncing it right, the Empowerment Center. Yes. And so if she could take two minutes, that would be great. Great. If you can state your name for the record and keep your testimony to two minutes, that'd be great. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Champion, thank you for being our champion uh, with this bill. I, I want to speak on behalf of all of our nonprofits that are doing people and hard work in Minneapolis and much beyond. And you have shown your confidence in us. And this, this uh, group here, this committee, has shown their confidence. The second bill that, uh, that Senator Champion is referencing is the one that supports the Empowerment Institute that is a part of Twin Cities Rise, a North, uh, a North Minneapolis nonprofit that you have supported now for 30 years. The bill will support allowing us to build a youth curriculum for personal empowerment. We are very good at providing this service to 18 plus, but what we have found is that the pandemic has hurt our youth the most. This grant, th this, um, this, these dollars will allow us to build the youth curriculum that we currently have for adults. The second part of this bill will allow us, Senator Alp um, Eric uh, Putnam, we, we are hoping to extend our empowerment services beyond the Twin Cities to go to St. Cloud, work with employers that are struggling to bring on and retain talent. We would like to do personal empowerment workshops for small and mid-sized employers so that they can attract, retain, and build their talent and build productivity. Thank you, Senator. Thank you so much. And then we'll go to your next testifier. If you can state your name for the record and keep your testimony to two minutes. Thank you, Chair Mohammed, uh, Chair Champion, members. My name is Elliot Butai. I'm with NAMI Minnesota. Uh, we represent people with mental illnesses and their families who are impacted. And we want to thank you for including the $4 million for individual placement and supports for people with mental illnesses. Um, as you heard in this committee already, uh, this program is very successful. And without this funding, some programs would be cut. And also, because of this funding, we can expand some of these programs. <clears throat> and I want to thank uh, Senator Muhammad for carrying that provision in Senate File 1779. I did want to mention one piece from uh, Senate File 1779 that was not included in the bill was a task force to examine barriers to people with mental illnesses to employment. And, you know, not everyone has a serious mental illness or may qualify for IPS. I live with a mental illness, and as you all know, working around here can be occasionally stressful but I also find it very fulfilling. And this is just one example of many people's experience. We know anxiety and depression saw record increases during the pandemic and are continuing. We also, thankfully, as a society, have begun to recognize things that we may not have historically, like the impact of trauma. So all people with mental illnesses deserve to do fulfilling work. And as you heard, work really does work in helping people recover. So we do have amendment language that um, would remove some of the administrative work and um, costs of, of establishing a formal task force, but still would direct deed to engage with stakeholders, including employers, which was a concern raised in this committee. So we'll hope that you'll consider this language either this year or next session, and we thank you for your hard work in this committee. Thank you so much. Um, next, we'll go to Elliot no, that was it. Baba Ote. Sorry if I said your name wrong. From NDL, NDC, DL. Yes. NDC. If you can state your full I'll name. I'll tell you my full name, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, thank you very much, committee members. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, Senator Champion, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Earlsworth Baba Lee Tang and I go by BABA. I work for the Neighborhood Development Center. Mm -hmm. I am the Director of Community Engagement. Um, I have been working with NDC for 17 years, so I am very confident in the work that NDC has been doing. 30 years track record of good work and accountability. First of all, I want to thank you for your trust, um, NDC, to continue the work that we've been doing. NDC was built to helping the people who are in need, and we have been doing that for 30 years. So I want to thank you for that. We, we thank you for the support. The support will help us to continue reaching people in the Twin Cities. We reached about 800 employ um, entrepreneurs last year, and this will help us to continue to grow. 
We also look forward to helping our greater Minnesota partners providing high quality one-on-one -on -one technical assistance to entrepreneurs in their communities and to helping them develop their own local business incubators. We recognize how hard you all have been working, I've been following it, and I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for the hard work that you've put into that and the trust that you have in NDC. When I look at the Promise Act, I love the word promise, and NDC is here to support. We work in collaboration with other community groups, providing help wherever we can, and we make a promise with, in alignment with this Promise Act that we will continue to do what we've been doing to make sure that the money that has been given is going to be used for the right way. So I'm Senator Champion, thank you. Madam Chair, thank you. And the committee, I want to just say thank you for all your hard work and for your trust in NDC and all the other, other organizations that are trying to make a better Minnesota. Thank you so much. That was right at two minutes. Um, next, we'll, we'll go to Malaska. I'm so sorry if I'm not saying your name properly. If you can state your name for the record once you get to the testifier's table, and keep your testimony to two minutes, and tell us who you're with. Thank you, Senator Ch Champion. Thank you, Senator Mohammed. My name is Milushka Navora, and I am in the board of the Lake Street Council. I am also a lawyer, and I um, represent primarily immigrant entrepreneurs in the corridor. I wanted to thank you from the bottom of my heart, you, Senator Mohammed, and you, Senator Champion, for your work with Licenses for All. Mm -hmm. It made a huge difference in acknowledging the dignity of my clients, and it, made a, it will make a huge difference in their lives. Um, I also want to thank you for the Promise Act, because what um, I see in the corridor is that for our, our entrepreneurs, they live in a very precarious situation. If they do not own their shop, if they do not own their salon or their restaurant, or if they do not have the economic capacity to invest in those shops. And I just wanted to conclude by saying uh, thank you to the committee and to um, uh, the state of Minnesota, DEED in particular, and NDC with, wh with whom we have collaborated for cultural malls deeply. And just to um, acknowledge the, the sense that we um, had in Lake Street when the, our, our businesses were burnt. Um, I, I had a fire burning outside my, my home for three days straight. And just about every single one of my clients had their business destroyed. And so that, I, and to see a community that has grown um, entrepreneurship and allowed us to be come to America with our dream from wherever we came from and realize it um, is a special place. And I think that as special places go, it is built on the community between neighbors, community between businesses, but also with the support of Lake Street Council because um, they were the first on the road to give us um, the opportunity to uh, apply for grants. And just that click made the difference in surviving. And then Hennepin County and the city of Minneapolis and other parties came. So huge thank you. And um, I am, as always, enormously impressed and delighted by your leadership. Thank, thank you. you. We appreciate your testimony. Next, we'll go to Scott with Greater Minnesota Partnership. Scott, once you get to the testifier's table, if you can state your full name for the record and keep your testimony to two minutes. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Scott McMahon of the Greater Minnesota Partnership. I want to thank you and Senator Champion for a number of things in this bill, uh, but two things in particular. One is the faith and confidence that was placed in the Minnesota Initiative Foundations and a number of positions in the bill. Uh, your faith is justified. We have great faith in them. We have seen them work uh, strategically in our communities and the impact that they have is deep and ongoing. Uh, secondly, with regards to uh, the Promise Act, um, one of the exciting opportunities with this bill is you have the ability in one of the rarities around here to take one-time money and make it ongoing and impactful for the state for decades to come. And I think the creativity in things like the Promise Act where we're trying to think strategically about how do we make investments that have long-term 
uh, major impacts in communities, both in the metro and greater Minnesota, uh, are things that take uh, the budget surplus that we see this year and turn it into uh, ongoing economic impact throughout the state. So thank you for that. Thank you so much, Scott. Next, and finally, no, next we'll go to Jessica Whipster. We're almost done with legal aid. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee and uh, Chair Champion. My name is Jessica Webster. I'm a staff attorney with Legal Aid. I represent workers who work at low wages and have low incomes, and I'm part of a small group advocating access and equity to unemployment insurance. This group includes Take Action, Isaiah, Say Tool, Awood Center, CDF, and Minnesota Budget Project. Madam Chair, this session, we brought forth a package of reforms to unemployment insurance to increase access and equity in the program. Deed asked us to amend one of those of the dozen reforms to reduce a 60-day appeal to 45 days, which we, as advocates, hesitantly agreed to, but they said they'd get back to us on the rest of the reforms, uh, which they were unable to do. So we're disappointed that one of the reforms that Deed has not vehemently or publicly opposed, and that has bipartisan support in the House, did not make it into this bill. Namely, that's that Minnesota is charging predatory rates to people who make mistakes in unemployment insurance. We have a 40% fine, which is higher than 40 other states. We have a 12% interest rate that's higher than 17 states. These fees and fines follow people for 10 years. Congress's cap on predatory lenders in the Military Lending Act is 36%. Property tax penalty is around 18%. Usuries is around 6 to 8 we're seeing folks at Legal Aid where a $2,000 overpayment has spiraled to $8,000. We're asking people to pay back four times what they were overpaid. So Madam Chair and Chair Champion, very respectfully, with a $17 billion surplus, we should not be chasing fees and interest on the backs of poor Minnesotans. At a minimum, we could reduce these fees and fines. If there's not time to do that yet this session, we could instruct Deed to come back and tell us a plan for reducing these fees and fines to bring us more in line with other states. So Deed, in closing, Deed repeatedly tells us that these fines and interest rates are set by the state. They are not responsible for them. The state is, the legislature is, and so we're imploring our leaders to look at those rates. Thank you for the time. Thank you so much, Jessica. And last but not least, we'll go with Lauren, who is the executive director um, for McGinty. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Champion and committee members. Um, I am Lauren Bennett McGinty, Executive Director of Explore Minnesota Tourism, and I'd like to share my thanks and gratitude to all of you for including this historic funding for Explore Minnesota in the budget. Our strategic plan outlines big goals for Minnesota to be a top 10 destination in all four seasons, and with the base budget increase and $12 million for funding Explore Minnesota for Business, we are moving closer to our goals to be able to truly compete and create a welcoming experience for all. I do want to note, however, the absence of one-time funding for Explore Minnesota's new initiatives to make Minnesota a top 10 destination in the hopes that we can continue to discuss the funding. The governor and lieutenant governor put forward the $11.8 million recommendation to fund these new initiatives to support our state's 11 tribal nations, a large increase to our diversity marketing and media spending, grant funding specifically focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives for state's destinations, and funding to support a new sustainability initiative aimed at ensuring Minnesota remains a beautiful place to visit for generations to come. At Explore Minnesota, we're committed to growing our work in diversity, marketing, and supporting our state's communities to do the same. The Making Minnesota a Top 10 Destination funding would allow us to further increase opportunities for destinations, communities, and tribal nations. The fact remains that we as Minnesotans continue to remain overly humble about what we have that's great. We cannot keep these things secret any longer, no matter how Minnesota nice we want to be about it. The time is now to make bold moves to address the fact that we continue to fall behind our competitors in the region, having been one of only three states in the country not to receive an increased budget throughout the pandemic. We are now in a position where we have to play catch up. The funding you've provided in this bill is the bold move we need. While I hope we can discuss the inclusion of making Minnesota a top 10 destination funding to help us jumpstart several new vital initiatives, we are incredibly thankful that you've heard our funding needs and are supportive of Explore Minnesota and important contributions to the state's economy. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Um, we'll give it to the members to ask questions. But Senator Champion, do you have anything else you want to add? Um, I, Madam Chair, I have no other questions that um, I want to ask. And if the committee wants to ask questions now, they can, or wait till uh, Friday when we mark up the bill. I think we have a taker. I think we have some questions, Senator Dreham. Thank you, Chair. Mm -hmm. uh, Senator Champion, uh, before there was a, a mention uh, that got me really excited about checking uh, I-90 or the 990s. Can you show me where in the bill that is? Senator that Champion? We're going to do that. I, I love the concept. I just wanted to read the language on it. Uh, Senator, Champion. Senator Chair, Senator Johan, that's something that we're doing in, internally. In fact, we've already started asking them for those 990s, and we have them. Senator Draham? So um, is it in statute? Uh, Senator, uh, 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 Madam Chair, Senator, no. It is something that we're doing because that's what we did even in 2016. We asked every organization to provide for us a 990, and so we have the 990s. And, 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 and we're doing our due diligence on the front end, and, and Dean will continue to do the work they need to do on the back end. Senator Draham, follow up? I think there's other members that, oh, well, I'm just going to say I, I would love to see something in, in the bill. I think it's a, a you know, we're, we're blessed right now with, with a surplus, but we won't always have a surplus. So, you know, anything we can do to start building those checks and balances to ensure the public that we're doing our job to make sure we're using the best use of their tax dollars, uh, I, I think would be great. So there might be an amendment coming down that pathway for Friday. Thank you, Senator Draham. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, you know, just to reiterate what, you know, Senator Draham said, I, there was an OLA report that came out specifically around grant making process that I think we should be looking at, at taking, um, taking those recommendations. But Senator Champion, I was wondering if we could get if you've got the 990s, if you'd be willing to share, if you could share them with all the committee members at least 24 hours ahead of, of uh, Friday's meeting, that would be great. Senator Champion. Madam Chair, Senator uh, um, uh, Pratt, absolutely. Uh, one of the things, I anticipated the question, and so I uh, thought we would bring those, those things together. Not to mention, again, I want to reiterate, uh, since 2016, even when uh, Chair uh, Cohen uh, was was in charge of finance, we made sure that this was a part of it because uh, we think that it's important for us to do, but we also want to be very clear that we do not want that only happening when it comes to, um, uh, you know, grants or direct appropriations for people of color. So we wanted to make sure that that message uh, wasn't lost and that it wasn't perceived the wrong way. So we want the same level of, of accountability and thoughtfulness no matter who gets the grant. Thank you, Senator Champion. Uh, Senator Housley. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Champion. My, my question was right along the lines of that because I was, I was trying to go through and look up the 990s um, at the website, but some, it's been delayed. If, if they haven't filed before 2021, it's difficult for us to find them. So that would be really great if we could get the copies of them. Thank Absolutely. You. And this is, uh, so Madam Chair. Senator Champion. Madam Chair, Senator Housley, we are certainly provide all those things we have. And I'm sure uh, many of the folks are still listening to me. And I know we've been making calls. So if you have your 990s, those in the room, make sure that we get the 990s so we can provide it at least 24 hours in advance. Oh, follow up, Madam Chair. Senator Housley. Um, thank you. And also, um, if they're registered with the Attorney General also. Senator Champion. We will certainly, Madam Chair, we will certainly look at that as well, and, and I'm sure that you all, along with us, will do our due diligence around that. Um, any other questions, members, for Senator Champion before we lay the bill on the table until Friday? One thing else that I'd like to say, Madam Chair, what is also exciting is that we have some new uh, um, uh, organizations, but we also have a lot of established organizations that have been with us for quite some time. So there's the stability there, there's the trust already there. Um, we even had a conversation with Deed uh, around, you know, some of the folks just to make sure that we were getting a variety of, th of thoughts and, 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 and perspectives. 
because we want to make sure that Deed's able to work with them, but also that we're pushing Deed and others to just be the best that they can be because we want every organization and business in our communities to get the support they need so that they can be the best they can be. Thank you, Senator Champion. We will lay the bill on the table until Friday. Thank you, members. With that, the committee is adjourned. We'll see you all on Friday.